verses 17 through 20. It can be found on the overhead screen behind me. Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. You spoke in the beginning, and all things came to be. You spoke, and your word came to live with us, full of grace and truth. Bless this place where we would hear your voice. Bless this place where we would hear your story. As we listen, may our ears be attuned to you. As the word is spoken, may you speak to us. May all we hear lead us to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> hear the word of God. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights, and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water, and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together, so that all may see and know. All may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created this. This is the word of the Lord. So if you were here last week, you know that I was in the pulpit last week as well. So you'll either find this morning redundant or consistent. We'll see. I spent um, three days this week over in Portland taking my oldest daughter to college, which is a big transition um, for both of us in our lives. And it was while I was in Portland that I got the news about Kevin's mom, and we spoke briefly Thursday morning before he left. And my heart breaks for him, um, for what he will be experiencing um, going forward now. Luckily, God had a sermon that I had stowed away in my back pocket um, from when I took a New Testament class. And so although you're not hearing about Lamentations this morning, that lost book of the Bible, you are going to hear from Exodus, which I hope is not totally lost to you, but who knows, maybe the story this morning isn't as familiar. But I think it fits well with what we've been talking about the last few weeks, and really just about learning the character of God and how we can learn that. But I'm going to start with the story this morning. In 1996, a young Marine corporal named Joey Mora was standing on a platform of an aircraft carrier patrolling the Iranian Sea. Incredibly and tragically, he fell overboard. His absence was not noticed for 36 hours. A search and rescue mission began, but was given up after another 24 hours. No one could survive in the sea without a life jacket for over 60 hours. His parents were notified and he was missing and presumed dead. The rest of the story is one of those where truth is stranger than fiction events. It's unbelievable. Four Pakistani fishermen found Joey Mora about 72 hours after he had fallen from the aircraft carrier. He was treading water in his sleep clinging to a makeshift flotation device made from his trousers, a skill learned in his military survival training. He was delirious when they pulled him into their fishing boat. His tongue was dry and cracked, and his throat was parched. About two years later, he was on the Today Show, and he recounted an unbelievable story of his will to live and his survival. Who wouldn't give up? He said it was God who kept him struggling to survive. His discovery by the fishermen makes searching for a needle in a haystack look like a piece of cake. But the most excruciating thing at all, all those hours that he was in the vastness of water, he said all that he could think in his brain was, water! He was thirsty. I want you to think for a minute about a time that you have been really physically thirsty. Maybe you've been out working hard in the yard, 
maybe you've been on a long car trip and you had no water with you. I want you to think about that time that you were thirsty. And we're going to go this morning to Exodus 15, 22 through 27. We're going to hear about a time that the Israelites were thirsty. Then Moses ordered Israel to set out from the Red Sea. And they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? He cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statue and an ordinance, and there he put them to the test. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees and they camped there by the water. The word of the Lord. And if we could go to my sermon slides, we're actually going to skip through. I had our scripture written up here as well. So I have heard this story several times about the Israelites, and I have to be honest, initially when I read it, I feel really frustrated with them. I just think, you guys are like, you are just delivered from Egypt. Like, you're in this great place where God has taken care of you. And now, you are complaining again because of a lack of water. But that's probably not very sensitive of me. Or really, it's not very sound of me. Because as I started to research this text more thoroughly, I read several commentaries. And one was from a woman named Laura Copley. And I'm guessing Laura is probably a mom, because she actually brought up the idea of being in a car with children who are thirsty. Are any of you familiar with this little thing, right? You're driving, you've been out running errands for 20 minutes, I'm thirsty, I can't do it. And they are just wanting water, wanting water as quickly as they can. So that started to give me a little bit different perspective because the Israelites would have had their children with them. I think as a parent, how that would be so challenging to have your little kids so thirsty, so weak, so hot, and not have any water available to them. The other thing that I read about was the fact that the Israelites are traveling with their families, with everything they own, and so it's very possible that they had some livestock with them. Many of you know I grew up in a, on a farm down in Rupert, Idaho, and my dad was a farmer slash rancher, and um, we had a huge herd of cattle. That was part of our livelihood. In the winter, we ate a lot of beef, a lot, like every day, and the rest of the cattle we would sell, and that is what helped us live for the rest of the year. He ran cows out on BLM ground, so I know Ron is familiar with what I'm talking about. Um, in the summer, we would take the cattle out near Minidoka Dam, and the government lets you have your cattle out there to graze. And so the water was pumped by windmills. And I am telling you something, if a windmill went out and there was no source of water for those cattle, it was an emergency. The ranchers had to get out there right away. So I decided to do a little research and read about cattle. Oh, it's so exciting. But cattle can go several weeks without food. But do you know how long they can go without water before they die? Just two to three days. So the situation was getting very, very dire for the Israelites. And they were losing trust as to whether God would provide for them again and take care of them. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper into the text, and I'm looking at the verse, um, number 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became 
fit to drink. We're going to hone in on Lord and the fact that the Lord is in all capital letters. And whenever you see that as you're reading in the Old Testament, that means we're looking at the Lord in a name of God, one of the names that tells us what God's character is. And in this particular instance, he is Jehovah Rapha, which means the God who heals. And if we take the Rapha section, the Hebrew for that means to mend, to cure, to heal, repair, repair thoroughly, or make whole. <laughs> the Lord was ready to respond to their desperation. He tells Moses about the stick, and when it's thrown in the water, almost supernaturally, the water is transfused and is available for him to drink and for the people to drink. He wants the people to depend on him when things are difficult, not on one another, not on themselves, but to hope in him and trust him for what they need. I'm wondering if some of you, like myself, have bitter water in your life. My guess is yes, because we're all humans, right? And so we all have something that we can consider our bitter water. And so my next question is, when you have something difficult that is happening, where do you run first? Who do you go to first? It might be your spouse, it might be your best friend, it might be your counselor, and all of those places are really great. Those are people that God has provided in our lives for us to run to when life is difficult. But what this text is showing us is that God wants to be the first person you run to. He is there, ready, and waiting to turn your water sweet and to offer you healing. In Jeremiah 33.3, God tells us, Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. We can't even comprehend what God our healer can do for us in our human mind. We just have to trust him and call upon him. In Jeremiah 32, 27, he says, I am the Lord, Lord, Rapha, right there, healer, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? What's the answer to that? No. No, nothing is too hard for God. Many of you know that part of my ministry here at Covenant is the Mothers of Preschoolers <laughs> program. We are going into our 12th year of MOPS. MOPS is an amazing ministry that is to women who have kids infants through preschoolers, and we also have a MOPS Next group, which is for moms of first through 12th graders. And the mission of MOPS is to serve mothers of the community by showing them the love of Jesus in just everyday, practical, loving ways. And I'm really excited about our group starting again this fall. We have a few moms from Covenant that come to this group, but really the main focus of MOPS is outreach to the community and women that come in. And one thing that MOPS does is it really provides us with a lot of resources and trains the leaders really well. And so every year we get some sort of book that they sent to us. And a couple of years ago, they sent us this book called People of the Second Chance, and it's by Pastor Mike Foster. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Pastor Foster. He is out of San Diego, and his mission is to meet people where they are in life and to embrace them and to share with them about our God the healer and how we have a God that is there for us in his infinite grace no matter where we've been and no matter what has happened many of us have countless setbacks in our life and some of those are due to our own choices and some of those are due to choices of others some of those are due to choices that are completely uncontrollable and so i love this idea of stressing 
to our society and to our culture, that we serve a God of second chances and that he is always waiting there to heal us. I love this quote by Pastor Foster who says, without the stains and scars, hope is an afterthought. Without our imperfections, there is nothing to place in the hands of God. Praise God for our imperfections and for the things that make us us, even though they may break us at times. There are several quotes in this book about how our God is a God of second chances, and I want to read a few of them to you. People of the second chance hold to the promise that broken things can be made beautiful again. People of the second chance understand that God's love gets in through our cracks and our breaks. People of the second chance break the chains of shame by sharing our unspoken stories. People of the second chance know that God waits beyond the doors that we may never even think to walk through. And people of the second chance know the Father's love and embrace self-acceptance. <laughs> the Father's love. We have God's covenant love that is showering down. In Hebrews 9.15, it says, For this reason Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Some of you have been with us for the last few seasons of Lent. And Kevin has done a compelling series each of those times about God's covenant love. <laughs> and in that series, real people, myself included, have came up talk show style and shared their stories of God's covenant love and of God's healing through brokenness. We've heard about God's covenant love through surprise divorce. We've heard about his covenant love through addiction, through a medical event that almost took one of our neighbors' lives, through the highs and lows of divorce, um, through life transitions that take you from where you thought God had placed you into a totally different way. And there's countless others. I'm not remembering everyone who spoke, so I apologize if I skipped you. But God's covenant love, hearing other people's stories and how God was at work in their lives is so powerful and gives us hope and shows us this character of God that the Israelites saw where he is God, our healer. And I am confident that that covenant love is with Kevin and his family as they go to his viewing tonight and as they go to his mother's service tonight. And knowing Kevin and how the Spirit is always at work within him, I know that he will share that with us when he is ready. As we talk about these stories and how powerful they are, I want you to begin to think about your story. What is your story? Not all our stories are dramatic. Some are just the day-to-day -day struggles that we face, being a mom, being a person, being in a marriage. But some of our struggles are deeper, and God has came to us in big ways. Are you able to see God's covenant love at work in your life? Have you seen that? As you think back, where has that been? And has God taken your bitter water and made it sweet? We've been talking a lot this um, summer about a program we're going to do this fall called Worship Plus, where we want to invite you not to just be in worship on Sundays, which is super important and is great, but we want to challenge you to go one step further and either be in a study or a small group or something else, serving 
that gets you working in God's covenant love. And part of that is going to be thinking about our stories. Um, Carol Bounds talked about all church studies and how much she loves them, and she's not here this morning. Um, but she already knows we have an all church study coming up in September. And it is going to focus on Abraham and Abraham's call. But we're going to talk about our spiritual autobiographies, about our stories, and how God has been at work, and how we can share that with one another to offer encouragement and to be there for one another in the highs and the lows. And so please be looking for that. Last week we handed out a little bit of a catalog of our adult education classes, and so um, it shows that we'll be doing the spiritual biography as we go forward this fall. So in the week ahead, I want to challenge you, or in the weeks ahead, to first of all, accept God's covenant love in those places in your life where you might be hurting and you need healing. And then also, I challenge you to how can we share that acceptance of God's covenant love in our lives with others. As we go out, let us be lights, as we have talked about so many times in service, to others so they can see God's love in us. Amen. Amen. Now, as the